Okay, so, good morning. Good to see all of you here um, for this presentation. First of all, uh, it's great to be here, to be invited by the uh, organization of in Romania. I have to disappoint you a little bit. I'm not going to talk to teach you how to do lock picking, but I will be doing that later on today. So this presentation is about lock picking and IT. Um, I've been lock picking for a long time. I have uh, been picking for over 20 years, and currently I'm the uh, chairman of the Dutch lock picking organization called Tool. So that's uh, one of the oldest in the world. The German one is, is a, bit, a little bit older. And I've been practicing for so many years that I'm actually quite fast at doing uh, lock picking. Um, so, what I'm going to talk, be talking about. If you see a IT system or a lock, you might be intimidated with all the components that are inside. And um, if you would try to break it, um, even with a complicated system, it's still possible. This is a lock that I bought when I did a presentation in Switzerland. This is a Swiss lock. And lo and behold, it didn't took me, take me too long to open this lock with the standard lock picking equipment. And if you are a black hat hacker, you would try to, like to try to get access to uh, data within a company. Um, you could try IT hacking, you could try physical hacking, and uh, I think it's important to understand that you should always use the path of least resistance. So in some cases, it's easier to do the physical route. As a matter of fact, I, in my day job, I've been doing uh, IT penetration tests for 15 years and doing uh, social engineering attacks and uh, physical pen testing. And I think that in most cases, uh, to get access to the data within a company, doing social engineering, physical pen testing, and then getting access to the data is much more easy than using IT attacks. But the result in the end is the same. Around. And in this presentation, I will be looking at the similarities between IT security and lock security. Right? So in my profession, I'm occupied with IT security. As a hobby, I'm doing lock security. And I thought to myself, well, in IT, you have all these classes of problems, like uh, design flaws, implementation flaws, user error. Do I see the same stuff in locks? And yes, you do. So the next 45 minutes, I will be talking about design flaws, implementation flaws, user error in the lock world. Right, and so it's important to understand that you should take the fast of least resistance. So when I saw the, the ATM machine and it was announced that there was a, uh, there were prices to be won, I had it over and I saw these locks. I actually opened them in less than 20 seconds. Um, and so I, I did have uh, unauthorized money with a uh, using tools of my liking, but unfortunately the guys at the ATM machine said this was not the way it was meant to be played. So, <laughs> unfortunately, no prizes for me. Anyway, so in the software uh, development, if you, if you build software, if you have the software development life cycle, you start with design of software, then you start implementing it, testing it, and the first problem <coughs> arises in the early stages of software development um, when you are designing your software. And I've seen this many cases uh, with our customers that software is being written by people that do not have formal training maybe, or are not aware of security issues. So they write software without a security mindset. And then it becomes an afterthought, and that's never very good. It's especially hard in software because if you are a software developer, people will be telling you what, to, what kind of software to write, and almost never do they, ask, do they ask you to write secure software. It's all about functionality. They ask you to write some software that performs a specific task. And ah, uh, a specific task. And uh, so security is, is an afterthought. In the lock industry, this is, uh, oh, and as an example, I, I've been trying to, uh, to uh, find examples of, uh, of these flaws in software and in hardware. And it's actually quite hard to find good examples of software design flaws. So I think in most cases also the, the problem arises in implementation. But this is an example. This is the Ariane 5 uh, rocket, and it exploded uh, shortly after takeoff uh, because of a design flaw. So they had a floating point exception. And in the design, uh, what they did was to, uh, the, the, to uh, 
catch each fault and do a full reboot of the system. And actually, in a hardware environment, that kind of makes sense. But if your rocket is going up with tremendous speed and you do a reboot, you're not fast enough to recover uh, the rocket to the correct trajectory. So that's the reason why this rocket blew up. And I think that's a design flaw. Now the question is, do we also have design flaws in locks? Yes, we do. But you might say that's, that's pretty rare because locks are always there for security. So that's a big difference between locks and software. In software, security is an afterthought. In locks, it's always about security. Locks are there to provide security. And also, lock manufacturers are pretty good at understanding the risks and building locks that cater to those risks. And also, locks are in many cases tested, so there are all kinds of certifications uh, in the Netherlands, you have SKG, in Germany you have the VDS certification. Um, locks are pretty simple compared to the software, so you can actually do some certification. So these are a few of the risks. So sometimes people ask me, what kind of lock should I uh, buy to use in my home? And then my question would be, well, what are you afraid of? Because there's different kinds of risks. You might be afraid that somebody is going to use lock picking to get to gain entrance. Although lock picking is actually quite hard and it's not normally not used for gaining a lawful entry to your house, unless you're maybe the FBI or something. But much more interesting is protection against force attacks like drilling or breaking, because that's what burglars use. Or maybe against lock picking or maybe key control. Maybe you're worried that if you lend your key to somebody, they are uh, able to easily make a copy of you. And you can protect against all of those risks. But to protect against all the risks, that's quite costly because the lock is very small and to, be able to put in all, that in, to put in all those um, measures is, is quite hard. But there are cases of, of uh, problems in, in lock design. So here's an example of a lock. Uh, it's actually a two-factor authentication lock, so you need to enter the, uh, the passcode and you also have an RFID card to open the lock. And in these kinds of locks uh, that are electronic, the problem is that they need to be fail-safe. If everything fails, the lock should open. So you are able to get out in case of calamity, there's a fire, uh, electricity goes down, you need to be able to leave the building. And this lock had a problem that uh, up here, does this work? No, it doesn't work. Oh. Sorry, it doesn't work. Can't point. Anyway, over there you see a paper clip that's being inserted next to the LED, and this touches the main board of the lock, uh, causes uh, a shortcut, a short uh, circuit, and the lock will go to its default state of being open. So that's maybe kind of a design flaw. Um, and that's actually a class of uh, uh, a type of design flaw that you see a lot in electronic locks. So there are many more locks that you can open by uh, making a shortcut. Oh, short circuit. Here's another one. This lock uh, is a is an electronic lock. Uh, the key holds a um, desk uh, uh, chip. It communicates with the lock wirelessly, and you need to have the correct key to open the lock. The correct digital key. That works, it's implemented pretty well, but in the end, if you have the correct key, something, uh, some mechanism pulls down a pin, allowing the lock to open. And that's a metal pin. So the problem with this lock is that you can just use a huge aluminium magnet, hold it in front of the lock, it will also retract the pin, and it will open the lock. And that's also an attack you see um, over and over again. It's something that lock designers uh, are not aware of, or not enough aware of. So this was in the news uh, a month ago, I think. This is a, a gun that you can, um, um, that learns your, your fingerprint, or, yeah, I think it was fingerprint, but if you, if you are, no, what was it? Right. So it's, so it's RFID, so you need to carry an RFID device that authenticates to the gun, and that will work. But in the end, there is also a mechanism with a metal pin that needs to be retracted. And if you use a big magnet, it will open again uh, as well. Or an 
Honor Guards. Um, this guy made this uh, thing. I also made one. It's, uh, it can be inserted into a hotel lock. It has a, a connector here. And it contains a small Arduino-like device. And it will talk to the lock using the API, requesting pieces of memory from the lock, including the piece of memory that contains the actual key, and then sends it back to the lock and opens it. But it's also a bit of a design problem in the lock. Another kind of design problem is this, but if you have a lock, uh, this is a component within the lock, this is what's actually causing the unlocking. So the ledge on top needs to go down to open the lock. Now, in many locks, mechanical locks, there, there is something mechanical that needs to move. And if you can apply outside force on the lock to induce this movement, you also open the lock. So that's another class of text that works on many locks. Here's an example. Can we? <laughs> on the right, you can see what's happening inside the lock. scary how easy this is. And this works on, on different locks as well, or on small safes or other devices. Okay, so far design problems. So there are a few design problems, and actually classes of design problems, and if lock manufacturers build new locks, uh, it's wise to, to test for these kind of problems. Now implementation error. I think we see that a lot in IT systems. Do we have that in locks? I did find one example. This is a white lock from the Netherlands, and it can be opened using a blank key. So the key has no bidding, but it will open the lock. And if you insert the blank into the lock, you put a little tension on it, you take the blank out, and then turn it like this, the lock opens. And um, yeah, it's a big design flaw in this lock. And here I'm going to try another one. Another technique that works is put tension on it, pull the key out, uh, stick the tip in, and open the lock. Now, as you can see, I, I don't think that's a design flaw. It's, it's more of an implementation flaw. So here you see how a lock normally operates. This is a standard five pin tunnel lock. The bike lock works in the same way. So we have pins consisting of two parts. The red parts are the upper pins, the blue parts are the lower pins, and there's springs underneath. What the key does is it pushes down on the pins so they all align perfectly at what is called the shear line, and then the lock can open. Now with this particular lock, this was the design of the lock, of the bike lock. And the design is actually okay, but the implementation is wrong. They, in the factory, they use the wrong pins, so they have pins the lower pins that were slightly thicker than the upper pins. So there was a mistake during manufacturing of these locks. And what happens is if you apply tension to the key, you pull it out, then all the pins have been pushed too far, right? This is a blank key, so the pins are pushed in too far, it won't open. But if you retract the key, all these blue pins will pop up exactly to where they need to be because they're a little bit thicker. And I've prepared a lock uh, like that here, so I can demonstrate. It has a blank key, it doesn't it fits the lock, but it doesn't operate. So I apply tension, take it out almost all the way, release a little bit, and uh, the demo effect. Sorry, I forgot to do the dance for the demo belts. <laughs>
how to protect information. So it's always a problem. It's interesting, this is a, a guy, let me read it out, it's, it's Nikos Toskas, he was the Deputy Minister for the Interior, responsible for the police and the country's intelligence uh, agency in Greece. And this was the picture that they put on the official the Greece uh, Parliament website. And you can see the, uh, the post-it memo there. If you blow it up, you can actually read them. It's password there. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> right, user error. You can make your system really secure, and you can have a really secure, this is not a secure password, but you have a really good secure password, and people will still put it on a post-it memo, memo, of course, it doesn't work. Well, the same with um, locks. Actually, the key could be considered sort of a uh, password for a lock. So you need to be careful with your keys. And here's an example of a, a news item on NBC in the United States. There were thefts from um, ATM machines at gas stations. So the ATM machines, they could use your credit card to buy gas for your car. And all these boxes have a lock. And if you open the lock, you can fit it around with the hardware. You can insert a skimmer device into the, into the box. Now, mechanics need to have access to all these boxes at all the gas stations, so they all have the same key. So once you have the key, you can open all of them and insert skimmers everywhere. And that's exactly what somebody had done. But MBC made an item and showed this key that, this, that the criminals used to open all those boxes. Well, as I said, a key is like a password, so if you see this, this is actually enough information to figure out the shape of the key and to figure out what the cuts are, because the cuts, you have know, discrete depth, maybe seven or nine, and if you measure, measure those, you can actually build more of the key. And we see this a lot. Um, we see the TSA keys, for, for instance, they've been leaked. This was a few years ago, somebody on eBay uh, from New York sold a key ring with um, uh, keys that are used to open electrical panels in town, all the elevators in New York, all the traffic light boxes in New York, the fireman key, fire alarm box key, and those keys are also the same for all of New York. So if you buy one of those sets, you're in. And the paper, the, I think it was the New York Times, they printed this picture in the paper and on the website, so thank you. It's really funny that there are actually companies that try to build systems that uh, have a little bit of resistance against this attack of copying the keys by looking at them. So for instance, uh, uh, Queso in uh, Switzerland, they make keys that have holes uh, drilled in that have no use other than to make it harder to, to look at the key and see what the actual bit is. But that's nice. So next I would like to show you a video of uh, one of the most famous Dutch hackers called Ongrijp, who is in an elevator at a Dutch Amsterdam metro st station and instead of pushing uh, the buttons for the for one of the two floors, he uses a key and then the elevator suddenly goes down to a nuclear shelter. Uh, 
this article from 2003, in which it says that already then um, the CDS repository of Linux was hacked, and a change was made in the source code that allowed uh, people to uh, object root rights, right, backdoor. They found it, and it never got to, to production. What's that? So do we have backdoors in, in logging systems? Yes, we do. You see it very often in these kinds of, of shapes. So I don't know how popular these are over here, but they uh, normally have an electronic lock. And the problem with electronic locks is that you need to think about what happens if you run out of batteries. So you've got your value bills in there, batteries are gone, how should I open the box? So there is a backdoor. And behind this piece of plastic, if you move that, you will see a keyhole and you can use the, the, the backdoor key. In this case, it's, it's not, the key is not that bad, but in many cases the key is really lousy, so it's, it's really easy to, uh, to pick the lock. So you have backdoor access. Even better story about backdoor access um, is this one. We need to go back to, uh, to the time when we still had Eastern Germany. In Eastern Germany, you could only buy state supply locks, of course, and these locks actually did have a backdoor. So the German secret police, the Stasi, they were able to enter anybody's home. And the trick is that, so this is a, a cutaway version of a lock, so a metal is cutaway, so you can see the insides. And remember from the picture I showed you before, each lock has a double pins, top pins, and a little spring. And you need to align all the pins to the back pipe for the lock to open. But the background in this case is the following. They made the, the space in here big enough to hold the spring, the bottom pin, and the top pin. You can actually push everything down into the lock, out of the plug, into the lock. And then there's nothing left here, and you can open the door. So what you see at the top left, the piece of metal, that's a universal key, so to say. In Germany they call it the Himmelschlüssel, or the heavenly key, and that will open any lock. So, it's funny that some locks that you can still buy, uh, like cheap uh, pet locks, still have this problem. So I just need to make sure that I have the, a tool with the spacing that's similar to where the pins are in the lock. I need to practice a little bit by putting it on in the correct position. And the lock opens. So this is also quite easy with some of the uh, cheaper locks, which I would say is a, it's kind of a big one. So moving on to, to keys, crypto. In crypto, we have the problem of key reuse. Uh, this is a one-time uh, path that was used in, in the Second World War. I believe this is a, a Russian one. So this is a code to use for, for your crypto messages. And, um, you may never use the same code twice because then you can do grid analysis and figure out the, uh, the, the original messages. So I scratch my head. Do we have something similar in logs? Mm, sort of. So again, here you see a standard lock in the closed position. And we have one in the open position where the pins align at the shell. Now, you might see locks that have multiple keys that will open them, master key systems. So you are in a big apartment complex, and the front door will be opened by all the keys of all the people living there, and your own door only opens with your own key. Now, in these kinds of systems, they can be implemented in different ways, but this is a popular way of doing that, and which is to cut up the pins in multiple pins. So there's actually more than one possibility for each pin to be in, the, in a correct position. So for each pin you cut up in two, you can build two keys that operate on the same lock. And here's one key inserted, that's one of the correct keys that opens this lock. So that's a bit like uh, key reuse in crypto. And the interesting thing is that if you live in such an apartment, so this is the front door key, you can actually take out the lock from the door, open it, so you take out all the pins, you can look at the height of all the pins, and if you do that with a, a few locks in your facility, then you can, by looking at where the cuts are, you can reverse engineer 
how the master key system works, and you can actually build the master key for the whole um, system. So that's because this, this is reused. Root user. In IT, I think it's, it's quite, a, quite a big problem that you have uh, omnipotent users, the users that can do anything, domain administrators, root users. I've done many uh, security tests where you enter a facility and you plug into the internal network and you just try to hack into the internal network and without much trouble you become domain admin and you have access to anything. What about logs? Well, actually, I've been talking about this a little bit already um, with the uh, gas pump uh, logs that, that are all the same for all the gas stations. And you see this a lot. Uh, many, not many people realize, but there are many places, instances, where mechanics uh, or service personnel need to have access to different kinds of, of boxes or locks. And they don't want to walk around with 200 keys. So what do you do? You use the same key for every of those boxes. So I, I walked around here in the old town and I made some pictures. So um, this is a phone box, for instance. I don't know how, how often you see those, but it could be that the lock on there is from the phone company, and once you have one key of that, you can open all of the boxes. So it's like a root user key. Uh, or on the telephones, I must say, by the way, that people in Romania are apparently very honest because the locks are not very sophisticated uh, as big resistance is concerned. So I think the best ones were, were on, the, uh, on the phone. But still, that's, that's not really high security, security lock, I, I would, would imagine. Some boxes were actually not even closed, they were held together with tape. <laughs> and what was interesting is that many boxes, like the gas uh, boxes, they have this key, so uh, I guess uh, it's quite easy here to get gain access to all kinds of, of stuff. Um, but you see that in many places, like elevator keys, uh, electricity boxes, etc. <coughs> Sample code. If you are a developer and you quickly need some, some code that works, you can try and take some sample code and sample stuff, sample stuff from the internet. Uh, don't bother about security and just use it. Now, sample code uh, in many cases is not very secure. And the same goes with, uh, with locks. Yes, there are but sample code locks. If you go to a supplier and you ask for a specific lock, uh, well, not for on your, on your home door, but if you want to have an industrial lock, say you are building kind of a machine, and it needs to have a key to turn on the machine. So you need a lock for your machine. So you go to the supplier and you say, I would like to have, I'm, I'm building 10,000 machines, I would like to have a lock, a lock that I can put in my machine. So they will sell you a lock, but that's a, a sample lock. It's, the lock is the same for everybody. So the supplier just has a, has a supply of one million of these locks that are all, all have the same key. And here's a story from Belgian television. There was this guy who made this item, I'll show it to you in a minute. And he got a call from somebody saying, well, if you go to this supplier and ask for a standard cylinder, you get one that is key to life. Everybody who buys a cylinder there gets the same cylinder. And these cylinders were also bought by the people who made these uh, boxes that operate these speed cameras. Of iemand die beweert dat hij heel eenvoudig met een sleuteltje de flitspaal op lopen krijgt en dat je ook die slotjes heel gemakkelijk kan kopen. Ik uh, onderzoek het. Sleuteltje naar nou. Ja, met die sleuteltjes. Volgens de mailschrijver zit dit in de flitspaal. Dan kan ik met die sleuteltjes de flitspaal open. Want het geheim van deze paal zit in deze kast. Hier. Je hebt hier een uh, slotje, zie je dit sleuteltje? Doe die niet thuis. Oh. Actually, I've been told that in Belgium this is actually allowed. It's not allowed to, uh, to, to break anything, but if you have the correct key, you can open the box, you can actually switch it off. And that's fine. <laughs> Um, not that I would want you to do this. Okay, so if you watch this clip, something else that you notice, maybe? The key. 
he showed the key. Yeah, remember what I told you about showing keys? He showed me the key to national television. It was actually YouTube. I made these screenshots from YouTube. And this was enough for me to make an educated guess about, about the exact bidding of the key. Actually, I was not sure for, for one position. So I, had, I made two keys. I went to Belgium. I, I don't live far from Belgium. I tried them. Yes, one of them did work. So yes, it is possible to use a screenshot to make a working key. Zero days. Yeah, I think we have zero days. They're, they're, they're very scary. I mean, uh, right, so this is a graph, the amount of attacks per, per vulnerability, and uh, at one point the vulnerability becomes known, the number of attacks rises, but this is the, the time, so the, the X, uh, axis is the time. So these are the weeks before the zero day has been exposed, and it's still a zero day, and people are still abusing it. Um, of course, in drugs you can find vulnerabilities that are not known yet, so then you have a zero day. One example is this lock manufacturer um, that is actually quite a nice company uh, from Germany. They make uh, uh, locks that for, for which you need to have an R ID tag to open it. And suddenly this video showed up on YouTube. Zero day. This ring is an aluminum ring, and in it are four magnets. And I've been told that what actually is happening is that because you're turning the magnet, there's an electromotor inside, and it will generate electricity within the motor, and that electricity then operates the actual lock. So inside the lock there's an electromotor attracting some kind of pin. Um, and you can open and close the lock using this uh, the magnet. It was, uh, it was not a nice experience for the company because this video showed up on the internet and two days later some company was selling these, uh, these aluminum rings. <laughs> so I prefer, of course, uh, uh, um, another form of disclosure, responsible disclosure. And as in, the, as in the IT world, there's also uh, different uh, attitudes that com lock companies have. So sometimes the lock companies, they say, well, my product is unbreakable. Uh, I must say that IT it doesn't happen that often anymore. So this is quite an old example of Oracle saying, well, uh, our new version of Oracle is unbreakable. Uh, then everybody starts hacking away and uh, it's not that break, but unbreakable after all. So we see that in the in, uh, lock industry as well. So this is, uh, Medico is uh, one of the best selling high security lock vendors in the USA. And they made a new lock and they said, uh, this cannot be opened uh, using lock picking techniques. And there was this guy, Mark uh, Tobias, he spent uh, six months uh, together with a friend trying to break the security of his lock. And in the end, uh, all he needed was um, this thing, um, and he was able to, uh, to open the lock in 30 <coughs> seconds. So that's not very good to, uh, to do, to tell people that your stuff is unbreakable and will attract a lot of people trying to actually break it. And then, if somebody breaks your lock, um, it's also wise to handle that in the correct way, okay? And with locks, not every manufacturer is really good at reacting to security vulnerabilities that have been um, made public. So remember this lock, this lock opens with the uh, uh, big magnet. So that was disclosed to the company, um, and, uh, and people asked the company to do something about it. And in fact, they put it on the website, an announcement that their lock was insecure, and people could exchange the locks, uh, after two weeks, that was rejected from the website, it was no longer there, uh, customers were left in the loop. And even then, if you would exchange the lock, you would get the new version, which had one improvement. If you used the magnet, something would break in the lock, it would still open. But it would break, so you could actually detect that somebody used this technique to gain entrance. So I don't think that's a very good uh, approach of doing uh, PR after a zero day. Ooh, tap into that. Brute force attacks. Um, to hack a password, depending on if you're allowed to do the multiple guesses, but you can uh, use all kinds of tools to just guess the password. In locks, that's, that's a bit more difficult. And it's 
also um, well obvious to make it uh, harder to do brute force guessing would be to put more pins in the locks. So you have six pin locks, seven pin locks, or even more. These have an incredible amount of pins, so that makes it more difficult. But that's not really a threat because brute forcing, brute forcing a standard pin tumbler, that's not that's not really easy. There's not really tools for that. So I have been discussing this with some people. Could you could you actually build a brute forcing robot for a standard cylinder? In theory, yes. In practice, I don't know. But for um, the safe locks, that's that's very well possible. For so safe locks, you need to dial the correct combination, and this dialing can be done using an, an auto dialer. This will take maybe a week to open your safe, but in the end it will work. And uh, you see a lot of people now, hobbyists, making auto dialers themselves from cheaper components. But it's actually not a big problem because those safes they are meant to deter an attacker for a certain amount of time. So if it takes a week to open a safe using an auto dialer, that's not really a threat to most people who have a safe. You don't have service attacks. Very easy in IT. Also very easy in locks. You don't see them often, luckily. But with a bit of super glue, that will get you uh, already uh, pretty far. And there's actually special keys that you can buy, uh, lock busting keys, that are specially designed to break your lock. So you insert them because of the shape. You cannot really retract them, and also they are weakened here, so you can easily snap off the top of the key, so this uh, inner part stays stuck. And your lock is inoperable. Sequential attacks. If you try to get to guess a username and a password, in some cases you can do it sequentially, right? So if you get a different uh, error message, if you give the wrong username, um, or the, wrong user, the right username with the wrong password, you can first guess a working username and then start guessing on the password. Now this is uh, sorry. this also works in, in logs. So sometimes you have more than one uh, row of pins. So this uh, as a twin, for instance, has two rows of bidding operating on two rows of pins, small pins and bigger pins. And with all these logs that incorporate two memory pins, it's it's all, uh, always the case that one of the row of, rows of pins will be the first to block the lock. And you can try to lock pick that row, then it will turn slightly, and then the next row will block, and you have to pick those. Too, so you can actually do them in sequence. So if this lock would have uh, five big pins and five small pins, it's like picking a 10 pin lock. Still, it's very hard, but it can be done. So this is how, how it works. And there are several ways of doing this. So this is the uh, EVA uh, 3KS. It uses pins on the side. And it also has these grooves operating on sliders. So here you can see how the sliders operate. You do first one, then the other. There's another system, this is from Medico. They have keys that are cut in a certain depth, but also in a certain angle. And the pins, they have a, uh, a groove in them. And the pins need to rotate and align for the groove to align with this pin that needs to go into the, uh, the red pin. So here you can see it again. It turns, the purple part goes in, and it opens. So you can do that sequentially. If you build an IT system um, and you would like to know how secure it is, you need to do some tests. So, it's always a bit difficult. What do you do? Do you, do you use automated scanners that will be cheap, give you some kind of idea? Uh, do you use a new experience security consultant to do some stuff? How do you know what kind, what kind of quality a person gives you? Certification, still a problem in IT security. Um, in logs, it's, it's a bit more easy. In logs, we do have working certification. And, um, this is a funny story. This is a lock, a German lock from a uh, Do manufacturer. And they wanted to have this lock certified in the Netherlands. And the way that certification works is that a, a security test lab gets the lock. They have a set of tools and they try to open the lock in any which way they like uh, or in any which way that has been written down that they are allowed to try. And then, depending on how long it takes to open the lock, they get one, two, or three stars.
stars. Actually, one star means two minutes, two stars is three minutes, and three stars is five minutes of uh, resistance. So that sounds like a very short time. But actually, if you're a burglar and it takes you five minutes to open the lock, you will move on to the next house. So actually, the certification does say something. So, but in the Netherlands, they tested this lock, and they were just a few seconds short of getting uh, know, two or three stars. A few seconds short of getting two stars. So they altered the lock, and this is the Dutch version. And you can see Dutch version has an SKG certification with two stars. So what's the difference between the German one and the Dutch one? Sorry? Small hole. Yeah, it's actually a ball bearing that's put in here, and that's the difference. So the, uh, the dome guy from Germany and the dome guy from the Netherlands, they were in the, in the bar discussing how to get the few extra seconds of um, resistance. And also you want to implement this in a, in a way that is as, as cheap as possible. And they got this idea to drill a little hole and push in a ball bearing. And it's really cheap. Drilling a hole is cheap. Ball bearings are cheap. And this helps uh, um, when somebody tries to use a drill to drill through the block. So the drill um, cannot drill through the, through the ball bearing. So that gave them a few extra seconds to get the certification. Uh, Dr. Ripple is, is just as uh, the, the tooling gets better in IT security testing and the knowledge you need to tests uh, drops. So it becomes much more easy, it becomes easier and easier to do security um, attacks. And that is something that is now also happening in the log world. And it's really interesting to see what will happen. Because the log world has been the same for a long, long time. And just now they start to, to wonder about what's happening on the internet. And people do log picking and talking about logs and vulnerabilities. It's completely new to the log industry. And also the tooling gets better. So and now you have uh, apps that you can use to make a picture of your key and you get a duplicate sent home. Well, I wouldn't send it to my own home, my own key. But. Or you can use uh, uh, molds to pour metal in to make a duplicate of a key. That works for many, many high security keys as well, if you know what you do. And 3D printing, of course, is getting better and better. So yes, it is possible to 3D print uh, a key. And, and so the problem is that if you have a key that has a, a shape that is protected by a patent and by a certificate, then now you can just print the key. What makes it a bit more difficult is that you also have keys with movable elements. So if the key in the top on the top, there is a piece of metal inside of the key that is movable. And it actually needs to move for the lock to open. So if you take it out, the key no longer works. And of course, it's pretty hard to, to print a movable element within the key. But we're not there yet, but people are experimenting and we're close to being able to print quite a lot of keys. And the security, well, in IT security, security is invisible. You, you can't really tell how secure the system is and you get what you, what you pay for. If you don't care about security, you want a cheaper solution, uh, you get something that's, that's insecure, and not everybody is a security expert, so you don't know that you're missing the security. And in logs as well. So logs are physical, you can see them, you, you can, can have your own ideas about how secure these logs might be. Um, but that's really mean, I think. So these are logs that we actually used in a competition in the Netherlands. Yes, there are log picking competitions. So we were allowed to try and open these locks using the lock picking tools. And uh, I have to say that we were also allowed to then keep on picking them and improving our times. So it's not the first time that counts, but after repetitive trying, the fastest time counts. But, um, so who thinks that this is the hardest to pick, takes the most time? This one? No one? Okay. okay. I'll, I'll show the, the actual times that we did.
So yes, the Mauer, uh, this is, by the way, a minute, so four minutes, 49 seconds for the Mauer. Uh, but as I see, I have 34 seconds. And this, maybe this was a lucky shot. It could be that one, one lock that you buy has a different pinning than the next one in the batch. So maybe this, we got a little bit lucky, I don't know. But, so you see that by just looking at the lock also, you cannot really tell much about the resistance against lock picking or other techniques. And I already talked about uh, uh, end users awareness is a problem. So this is really funny. This was a uh, uh, <coughs> thing at the, at the uh, security conference where you could charge your phone. But of course, it doesn't just charge your phone. It just retrieves all the information from your phone. And people there were actually still using it. And this ATM machine that was at the, at the DEF, DEF CON that was carried into the uh, casino, and nobody knew who did this. <laughs> Um, so awareness is a problem. People are not aware that they should not be showing keys uh, on, on, uh, to other people. Um, and this is really interesting. This is a lock I bought in the Netherlands for one euro fifty. So I don't know how many years later that is, but not that many. Um, and this lock is, is so bad that it does work with the correct key. I have a second one. And the key does not work, so sounds good. But if I take it out a notch, it still works. How is this possible? Actually, if I use the wrong cylinder and take it out a few notches, it also works. So it's, it's mind boggling how bad keys, uh, some uh, locks are, and also mind boggling that people are actually using those keys on the doors. So, bottom line is you actually need, need a holistic view. You're not just depending on the lock, it's, it's the same within IT. It's not just about doing IT security, because somebody can just walk into your facility and get access to your, to your physical data center, it's game over. And the same with locks, it's not just the cylinder, but it's the whole system around it, your security is, is the weakest link. And in fact, I haven't been talking about all these kinds of things, that would take me another hour, but there are all kinds of tricks to get into a facility without actually circumventing the lock. Right? Um, so in the end, I think it's, it's, it's really important to do threat modeling, to, to think about what, your, what the risks are, um, and figuring out where to improve the security. And it's, it's the same within IT security as with physical security. So I'm almost at the end of my talk. Um, afterwards, I will be uh, heading down to, I think it's uh, the Hicken Village or the, the first hall. Uh, there will be a table there. I have some locks, I have some lock picks. I will do a short introduction on how to pick locks. And you are all uh, invited to join me and try and pick locks. If you want to uh, reach out to me or want to know more about physical pen testing, there's this uh, uh, other talk uh, that you can watch online, or you can contact me via email. So, question time.